grace of God seen in Jesus Christ for us. Think of the songs we just sang, the wondrous songs of his grace and love and mercy and forgiveness. All of it was the gospel. You can't add to it or take from it. You ruin it. You pervert it. And so that's what Paul is writing to the Galatians about. He's writing about the purity of the gospel, that which the gospel should be as it's proclaimed. There's many quote-unquote gospels out there, but only the true gospel saves. And so that's what Paul is talking about. Again, a refresher. In the middle of modern-day Turkey, the swath across it would have been what was called Galatia, filled with the Gaul people, or Galtoi, Keltoi, Celtic, Gaelic people. Eventually, they all left later on in life. <laughs> later on, you know, they kind of just left past the Roman period of time, and that was filled up with the Turkic peoples that we see today. So there are different people. Okay. These, the people who were there were different people than are there now. There's some people who are still the same in this area. But that region changed. So during that time, many of them were saved. And Paul planted churches in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And again, here's another close-up picture being sent out from Antioch, eventually in through the Galatian region. That's why it opens up and says the churches of Galatia. Churches, plural. So that region there was affected by what he is talking about. So let's listen to the Word of God from actually chapter 1 all the way to the verses we're going to go to today. Catch it up because it really is one thought. It really is one thought. And he is going to switch that thought next week in verse 11 of chapter 2 onward. So he's laying a foundation. Paul is laying a foundation to make his premise to the Galatian church to help them understand their shared history with the shared gospel that Paul himself preached and taught and to bring them to remembrance of all these shared events in history that, that should have hindered them from accepting this false gospel. And now he's going to try to bring them back. And you see, that's what we should do, always be rescuing. So let's, uh, if you'd like to stand as we uh, hear the word of God. The Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Galatians. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you, and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure, and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not lie." 
Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they were hearing only, He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. Chapter 2. Then after fourteen years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation, and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run, or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man, for those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles, and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. You may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. So we're going to look at the kind of the timeline now the reason why Paul is giving this timeline to them is to rehearse before them that which is shared history with them. You've ever been on a trip with a bunch of families or you've been on some sort of uh, sporting kind of event. There is shared experience, shared history, shared events that you go through that you can recall and bring together. And sometimes you share about the great things or the funny things or the you remember what happened when the tent blew away and it, we all laughed back then, you know, we laugh now, maybe we weren't laughing then. Those kinds of things. Well, that's what he's doing here. He's saying, there are some of these events that I'm talking about, not only my own personal history, Paul is saying, but also that which intersects with you. We talked a little bit about that last week, how it intersected with their history in the fact that he and Barnabas and their team planted those churches in Galatia on their first missionary journey. So they should be understanding this as well as they received the letter that came out of the council in Jerusalem in Acts 15 that the Gentiles do not have to follow the law in order to be saved or to keep their salvation after they're saved. So they were recipients of that letter as well. All those churches were. So we see and kind of rehearse here his, Paul's greeting, then his warning. In verses 6 through 10 of chapter 1, we find him marveling. He says, I marvel that you have left him, turned away from him who called you in his grace in Christ Jesus. Turned away from him, that is, turned away from God. So there, you can never divorce the gospel message from the very person of who God is. We cannot divorce this message. That is, when we speak the message of the gospel, it isn't just a bunch of words and sentences we have to make sure we get right, but that it points to and helps to lead people to a personal relationship with God. It is not some philosophy. Think of all the religions in the world. I'll just even name one, Buddhism. Buddhism is basically religious atheism. They don't really believe in a true God. It just happened. And the mythology and the background of it is amazing. You can almost parallel why a lot of Buddhists become atheists and evolutionists because it's almost the same. You see, so that is a philosophy. He would never say you're supposed to trust in Gautama Buddha. You see, you can't trust in him. He's dead. He even said, don't trust in me, but listen to what my philosophy says and see if it works. You see, so you have... That is a philosophy. You have these 12-step programs that are philosophies. All of these things are rescue efforts in which you have to 
with self-effort, rescue yourself, right? Or fix yourself. And there is something in there saying that there's something wrong with us. You ever notice that? Every one of those religions, even Hinduism, you got to wash in the Ganges River, that ugly, horrible, bacteria-infested river that's so dirty and polluted. But they think that that will wash away their sins. Well, they acknowledge they're sinful. You see, so every religion really acknowledges they're sinful, except the New Age ones that have come today, that have been borrowed from the East and put in a blender and all put together with some self-help stuff, you know, a little Zig Ziglar in there, and it comes out New Age. So Paul is addressing them in the sense that they turned away from him. They turned away from him. And then he starts rehearsing that the gospel that he is preaching and proclaiming is validated by his visits back to Jerusalem to the apostles. But again, it's going to be validated at the end of their first missionary trip after they plant the churches and after the council. So we see that he's, he, he is saved in Acts 9. He goes to Arabia, returns to Damascus, has a basket escape, goes up to Jerusalem. Then he goes back to Tarsus. Then Barnabas calls on him to be a part of the Antioch church. And then Acts 13, we see what happens there that Barnabas and Saul are sent out. So Acts 13 and 14 is their missionary trip. Acts 15 is what he's going to talk about today, a little bit about how these people who had secretly, stealthily uh, injected themselves to get this heresy inf infection into these churches. And then Galatians 2, 1 through 10 really is about the after the 14 years, after he goes up to the church council in Acts 15, and we find out it's the same gospel, shared gospel, for Jews and Gentiles. Okay? So that's kind of a bigger overview. Now we're going to look through it. It says, Then after 14 years I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas, also took Titus with me, and I went by revelation and communicated to them the gospel. That is the gospel message which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those who are reputation. So we know that he met with the council. Eventually, he, you know, first he's greeted by the whole church, but then they had to take up this, this issue about the Judaizers and the Hebrew Roots Movement stuff. And so privately he had to meet with the apostles and elders, and that's what he's talking about here. Lest by any means I might run and had run in vain, yet not even Titus who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So even there in the midst of the apostles and elders, at the home base of Jerusalem, they were obeying the gospel in the sense of, hey, here's a Greek guy. He did not have to become circumcised. That is, he didn't have to obey all the laws of Moses. See, circumcision was kind of like this banner flag that says, it's not just circumcision, it's all the law of God. That is, all the feasts, Sabbath days, all of the, all of the dietary laws, everything that would make you a Jew and recognized as a Jew by other Jews. That's what he's talking about. That was not compelled on Titus even, as well. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out. Sounds like James Bond kind of thing. The spies, you know. Um, to spy out our liberty, our freedom, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. You see, false doctrine always brings us into bondage in some way, shape, or form. It brings us into bondage, and that's what he's talking about here. Now, freedom in Christ does not mean I'm free to do anything I want that the old sinful flesh says that I want, that the world says that I should want, you know, those kinds of things. Freedom means freedom to follow Christ freely without hindrance. So we, we talk a lot about liberty today, but people think liberty means anything that you could do. Not just that you can do. I mean, people can kill each other. Is that something to be free about? You know, people could rob banks because I can physically able to do it? Because I'm physically able to do certain things? No. He's talking about freedom in Christ, which we have in Christ, the freedom we have in Christ. The freedom in Christ is not the same as following the law of Moses. Now that the new covenant has come. Does that make sense? So Paul and Barnabas, after returning to Antioch after their mission to the Gentiles, 
which included these Galatians. So he's rehearsing history here. They encounter some Judaizers, Hebrew Roots Movement legalists. We have Hebrew Roots Movement legalists today, now. And they will tell you that, that um, you need to follow all the laws of Moses. You see, Jesus came, and I'll do, use this. Jesus came to fulfill. And Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Okay, So they'll look, use those two together and convolute and say, well, you have to obey all the laws of the Old Testament as well. Now, isn't that exactly the same thing as these Judaizers? But they do that today. They will say that everything I'm saying right now is a lie. And I know it because they've commented in the posts that I've said on, on Facebook. You're a liar. You don't understand because so-and-so teacher says, see, they'll pull up the authority out of their back pocket of some Judaizer or Hebrew Roots Movement legalist teacher and will say, oh, no, you're supposed to only worship God on the Sabbath or you only can do these certain things. Well, once you do that, you come back into bondage, you see. That's where the bondage comes in, to bind you to legalism, to constrain you from that which Christ wants you to be doing and to be. And they'll say that you're not really a Christian. You're not a real follower of Yeshua. You're not a real Yeshua follower unless you do all these things. They will say this line upon line, verse upon verse today. They will twist things around. It is not what just Paul experienced back then. It has never died. It has its own permutation, its own new masks, its own new packaging, and it keeps coming up every generation. And we see it very sneaky. It's almost like Hebrew Roots Movement legalist light in many churches. Oh, well, you have to dress a certain way. You have to speak a certain way. You have to fill in the blank a certain way, you see. Once they do that, they're opposing or putting onto you that which would be an external force, which is bondage, like chains. You see, they're trying to put onto you a weight of something that would bind you to something that isn't Christ. And so that's what Paul is writing about. That's what these guys were doing. That's what these Judaizers who secretly, stealthily came in, these false brethren. Notice he says false brethren. We will see them in the council. And they're sitting in the council as if they are Christians who came from the, Fer the party of the Pharisees, it says. They came to Christ, supposedly. But Paul calls them false brethren. Interesting. See, people can look like they're Christians, but they can be false. That is, what they hold to and what they proclaim and purport is false. And here we go. Here's Acts 15. And this is a rehearsal of what he's talking about. This brings you back into context. So Paul and Barnabas come back to Antioch. When they come back to Antioch, the mother church that sent them out, this is what he says. And certain men came down from Judea to Antioch and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. See, that's a, that's a truth claim. That's something where somebody says, in order to be saved, you must jump through this hoop. I will tell you from the biblical standpoint, in order to be saved, you must repent of your sins and trust in the Savior, Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, God, King. You must trust in His finished work, not in your works, right? So we turn away from our sins, but even that is a work of God as we are surrendering, as we are admitting we're sinners and trusting in Him. It's the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that drives us to the cross, right? Exposing our sin. This is a work of God. But here, this is a work of man. It says, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. What they're implying here is that they have to follow and be a Jew according to the customs of Moses in order to be saved. Not just being circumcised. There's the whole package. So verse 2, therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute. That's a polite way of saying they had a blow-up row. 
as they would say in Britain. They had a very, very, very huge argument, a blow up, going to split the church over this matter. That's why it says no small. It is very large. It's another way of saying it's explosive dissension and dispute with them. They determined, that is the church there determined, they determined by praying, just like they did in Acts 13, they prayed, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders. So who, who are they going to go to? Not the whole church, but the private matter. That's why he says he went up there privately to speak. So it was the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on the way, they passed uh, through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gospels, and they caused great joy for all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they re were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. And they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, hear that? Some of the sect or party of the Pharisees who believed, that is, they were law keepers, Pharisaical, just like Paul was. Remember, Paul came from the sect of the Pharisees. He's a Pharisee of Pharisee, a Jew of Jews. So they came from his same background, and he is opposing them. And they believed, that is, they believed that Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah. Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. They became part of that local church. But it sounds like they still held on to their Phariseeism, the baggage. And people come into churches, and they come in with all kinds of baggage. Well, it needs to be confronted if that baggage is full of falsity. All right? So what happens here? He says, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So this, this is the full, this is the full package. You must, if you are going to be saved, what they're saying, the claim is, then you must be a Jew of a Jew of a Jew. You have to be Jewish. If you are a Gentile, you need to proselyte, be a proselyte. That is a convert to Judaism. Then you can be saved. And you better keep that law of Moses. Keep the law while you're saved because that's going to maintain your salvation. You can't be saved and continue to be saved unless you keep the law of Moses. That is the premise. Okay? That is exactly the same premise of the Hebrew Roots Movement legalists today. Now, discovering the Hebrew Roots of, the, of Christianity, that is good. We need to because it is Hebrew Roots. I mean, it's Hebrew from cover to cover. It's filled with, with everything that relates to he Hebraic Roots. We know this. But we are in a new covenant. See, it's context and covenant context and covenant. So in this case, this question has to be considered. Now, who considers it? The whole church? No. It's not one of those church vote things, democratic thing. It is the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And if you want to know the rest, you can go to that, that website, address it. I have a lot of videos there that go back over this that I've taught on, as well as the article itself, giving you the premise that what they're saying is wrong. And what their conclusion was in Acts 15 is that, well, we'll see. So Paul rehearses this shared history of, the, of that council meeting. And the question was this, should Gentiles coming to faith in Jesus for salvation, should they first, even before they're saved, become a Jew keeping or a, a law keeping Jew? A law keeping Jew. Should they become law keeping Jews first? That is, hold on, we know you want to come to Christ, but look, you've got to first become, we've got to go through this class and learn how to be a Jew, and then you've got to start practicing it, and then, and then we'll receive you. Isn't that exactly what they're saying? You must follow the law of Moses first. You must be circumcised to be saved. You must follow the law of Moses to be saved. That's what they're saying. So they had to consider that. Secondly, after you come to Christ, should they keep the law in order to maintain their salvation? Does that make sense? 
So in order to hold on to your salvation, you see, you, could, you might lose it. That's really what's implied here. If you don't keep it correctly, you might lose your salvation. No, I'm telling you, that's exactly what the implications are. Isn't that amazing? So right there, these, these are premises and bases for what their truth claim is. So this is taken up in great detail with even great dispute with testimony by Peter and Paul and Barnabas. They all give their testimony of how Gentiles came to faith and they did not, that is those apostles did not lay upon them this. That is, you, know, you have to follow the law of Moses. And they were still saved. Think of Cornelius' household. And those were law-keeping Gentiles already. We already see they were pretty much kind of law-keeping Gentiles. They were God-fearers, Gentile God-fearers. And, and yet there, Peter did not lay upon them, well, now you have to go, go to the temple and you know, go three, three times a year and all those kinds of things. None of that was laid upon them. So the answer is no. The council says no, no to works salvation, no to works sanctification based upon the law of Moses. Personal effort, no. No. That's what they came back with. And you could read through Acts 15 to find that. So the next part that he wants to talk about is the implication here. The implication, that is the impact, the after effect, the result, how it applies. So he says, but from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. So Paul is not dissing at his putting down the apostles as if they're nothing. He wasn't disrespecting them. What he was saying was from the gospel's Focus from the focus on the gospel, what he was looking for is the integrity of the content of the gospel message. Does that make sense? So he was saying that those people who were of reputation, the apostles, they didn't add anything to him, what his message was, any of his ministry. It wasn't like, oh, you know, Paul, you forgot this. You forgot this part. Nothing there. You see, also, notice he talks about those who are of reputation. And it does remind us of even today, when folks focus on, well, these certain teachers who are really popular and have huge followings. Well, if they say something just because they're popular and have reputation, just because they say it, well, it must be true. And you see people do that. They shortcut discernment. They shortcut biblical discernment in lieu of relationship and popularity and reputation of those people that they have in their heart. It's very similar to what uh, Paul warned Timothy about, the itching ear syndrome. That they would turn away from truth and follow people and have these certain teachers in their back pocket that they always come to. You'd be amazed. So I post these kinds of things about showing the integrity of the gospel on the internet. And people who are infected with the false doctrine of this Hebrew roots movement legalism, they will say, oh, Andy, you don't understand the book of Hebrews or the book of Galatians and so and so. And then they'll give me a reference to some teacher who is twisting scripture, but they are of reputation and they have thousands of people following them. And because of that reputation, they feel that they are somebody. And so therefore they can come to me and say, Andy, you're lying about this because so-and-so said, or you don't understand the book of Hebrews, or you don't understand the book of Galatians. Right. I can read. <laughs> it wasn't that hard to understand those books. At least it wasn't for me. So plain reading of scripture, but we see this happen today. And that's why Paul talks about this. He is not talking about, oh, those apostles, they're just nothing to me. It makes no difference to me. Why? Because Jesus is everything. Even the apostles aren't anything compared to what Jesus says, what the Word of God says. No matter what their reputation is, 
He's focusing on the content, the integrity of the content of the message of the gospel of Christ. That's what matters. And he says, for those who seem to be something added nothing to me, but on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised, gospel for the uncircumcised means the gospel message that, and the ministry toward the Gentiles, okay, uncircumcised, had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised, that is to the Jews, to Israel. So when you see circumcised, uncircumcised, uncircumcised means Gentiles, circumcised means Jews or Israel. As was committed to Peter, verse 8, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. Okay, so here you go. You have two ministry stream, uh, streams. Jewish ministry gospel ministry. Gentile ministry, gospel ministry to the Gentiles. When they compare notes, hey, guess what? It's the same gospel. Although their approach to the Jews might be a little different, and the approach to the Gentiles, the end result of the gospel message, that which is taught to them, that which is proclaimed to them, it is exactly the same. Didn't that kind of remind you of Romans 1.16? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all those who believe, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. See, it's the same gospel that goes to both. It is not different, and it can't be any different today. But you would think it would be if you're a Hebrew Roots Movement legalist. You would think, oh, it's the gospel and then plus. Or, I need to clean up my act. Oh, so... The effectiveness of the crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection isn't enough to save you and to transform you. That God, the Holy Spirit, isn't enough to come into you and apply all that Christ purchased on the cross in his transforming work in our lives to change us to be more like Jesus, to follow the law written in our heart, the new covenant law written in our heart by the Holy Spirit that we would follow Oh, no, no, no. You externally have to do these things. And that's what the Hebrew Roots movement does. It adds to the gospel. So for the Jew or the Gentile, it's the same gospel, same salvation, same Savior and Lord. And then he says that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. This is interesting because it does show you the flavor of their ministry of the things they wrote. Okay, so when you read most of Paul's writings, and I will say Hebrews was written by Paul because the early church, the very early church, believed that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. It wasn't until 16, 1700s that the German school of higher learning and higher criticism started to question that. So they're Johnny come lately. The early church, as far back as you could go, in the 100s, believed that Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, was written by Paul. So, regardless, so you have, that's an exception, but so most of what Paul wrote, you can see is targeted toward Gentiles. Those who do not have a Jewish background, or if they did, they may have been converts or whatever, or it might be to a church that's minority Jewish, but mainly Gentile. Okay? And then we look at that which is written by Peter, James, that is the brother of Jesus, not Peter and James and John, you know, like James and John, the, the, the sons of thunder. That James was beheaded in Acts 12. So now we're talking about James, the brother of Jesus, half-brother of Jesus, James the elder. That is, he's one of the elders of the, of the church in Jerusalem. He may have been the spokesperson elder. So you, when you look at Peter, James, and John's writings, okay, so think about it. First and second Peter, first, second, third John, book Revelation, the Gospel of John, and then you have the book of James. Very Hebraic. Now, it's interesting that the Gospel of John was written one of the latest, and it does have a flavor of how a Gentile might intersect with it as well. Does that make sense? So that's later on in his life that he wrote that. But you look through the book of Revelation, is it not Hebraic? Is it not Israeli? You see Jewish themes all over in there. And the same with Peter. Both books were written to those who were the scattered. 
the scattered Jewish and Israeli tribes, and the same with James. So when you read those books, when you read those books, you can see the flavor of those who had a Jewish background, how it makes sense. A person who is a Gentile background, reading the book of James, it almost sounds legalistic. You see? So where you're coming from, how it affects you, you have to kind of know the context to get the principles that are there. From us who are Gentiles, we read Book of Romans. It's very understandable. You read Book of Galatians or Ephesians. Very understandable because we have a Gentile mindset, the way we think. And so it helps us to understand. Right here, this helps us understand what their ministry focus was right there in the Bible. And the Bible interpreting the Bible actually helps us to understand the ministry approach. But regardless, the end result is the gospel and the church growing in Christ according to sound doctrine, always. Even Peter wrote that some of the things that Paul writes are hard to understand, he says. Well, why is he saying that? Because he's writing most of what Paul is writing to is Gentiles, and who is Peter writing to? The lost tribes of Israel and, and Jews. You see, so you can tell there's a different flavor there. But he says that what Paul writes is scripture. So I, I, I'm amazed by that. So Paul wrote to us. And if you have a Jewish background and you were Jewish, then look to Peter, James and John. So the rehearsal of the shared history and the shared gospel is the same gospel of Jews and Gentiles. So what is he trying to do? He is seeking to expose, lay a foundation so that he can expose this false doctrine. He wants to lay a foundation so they're understanding, hey, I remember that. Yeah, that letter that came from Jerusalem that said Gentiles don't have to follow the law of God, the Old Testament Mosaic law of God, to be saved nor to keep our salvation. Yeah, I remember that letter. You see, somehow they've forgotten. And that tells you right here how easy it is for a genuine, born-again Christian who is truly born again. They're going to heaven. They are saved. How a person can be easily deceived, or at least deceived over a period of time. Because somehow they forgot. They did not stay in the Word of God. I'm sure they had a copy. Just at least one copy, but they could all share it there in that church family or those churches, those church families. Let me say this. Every religion has something like this. How you get saved and how you are to live. Now, saved meaning how you're in the group, how you're in the group of the holy people or in the group where there's something about you that's different than others or whatever. I mean, I'm going to reduce it down to that. And when it comes to the gospel, the gospel has everything to do with how you get saved so you're right with God and how we are to live for him after the fact. If you read the book of Romans, you'll see that. It's the whole thing. It's the whole shlemiel. Everything's in there. We'll see that in the book of Ephesians and others. They, they talk about foundational doctrine and then how we should live it. Okay? How we are to live it as a as a church. So those are the two aspects this false gospel attack. That's the two parts that they corrupt. That is the central part of how you get into the group, how you get into the community, how you get saved, and then how you are to live. Those two aspects have been perverted by this doctrine of the Hebrew Roots Movement legalism. The Judaizers that would follow along. Paul plants a church and they kind of follow along and corrupt it. And people listen, and Paul can't get back there fast enough to help them or send a letter fast enough. You see? So how a person gets saved, and then how they are to live. And that's how it is in everything. From atheism, think about it. In atheism, evolutionism, origins, all of that has to do with now you are this bag of molecules, randomly put together, and you inherited that over billions of years. And how are you to live? Well, it doesn't matter. Just make sure you don't hurt each other. 
or, or whatever. Or if you took the Darwinian model of his two books, at least the two main books, you are to have survival of the fittest. And out comes eugenics. Only the, the powerful and the good, what they would perceive as good, are to survive, and the rest we slaughter. No, I'm just read. People who are following evolutionism don't understand what he wrote. Those two books are the most racist, bigoted books on the planet. If you're a black person, it makes no sense for you to be an evolutionist because Darwin hated any of the, the what he called inferior races because they weren't evolved enough, but the white Anglo-Saxon Western European person was the highest of evolved evolutionary humanity. And they should rule over all of the other races. And that's why you see the English as they did things or the Germans as they did things, they had this sense that they need to rule over these lower classes. That's what continued to allow the racism and eugenics and all those kinds of things. Do you see? So how you get saved or what you are or whatever, and then how you are to live, how you're to live it out. See if the root is false and then you'll see what happens and it's corruption and death. Just like Jesus said, the thief only comes to steal, kill and destroy. So everything that Satan and his ideologies, all they do is steal, kill and destroy. And you see that all the time. So that's exactly what he's talking about here. He wants to expose this to show them and it's eventually going to come out to death. You see, you say that maybe you are genuinely saved. You got born again. You are genuinely follow, you follow Jesus to the cross and you were saved. But then after that, you start living a false gospel. That is the false way of living, not the way that Christ wants you to follow, but the Hebrew roots movement legalism. Then by your life and lips, you are proclaiming a false gospel. And that's what Paul is talking about as well. What, what is the life of that church communicating to the world? And that is what the gospel is that they will catch. That is those who are listening and seeing. And so they will become false brethren, false converts, and they will be legalists. And, and, and you see that with kids in churches where they catch the legalism and they become legalists. And the focus isn't those people need to get saved in Christ, but they're, they're not doing things right or they're not wearing clothes right, or their hair is too thick, or whatever it is. It's something always external they focus on, because really that's what they think following God is. It's external obedience, but because they're caught in bondage, that's what happens. So they're proclaiming the false gospel. So genuine gospel in Christ is about the real God, real human sinfulness, real Savior and Lord, real Jesus Christ, who is the rede Redeemer, Rescuer from the wrath of God to come. It is the grace of God, not based upon works. Now, Paul makes this clear in, John, uh, in Romans chapter 3, 19 through 20. Romans chapter 3, 19 through 20. It says, now we know that whatever the law says, and he's talking about the law of Moses, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So let's stop here. It just shows we're sinners. If you really understand the core of the law of Moses, it was to show us how we could not approach God on our own without some sort of redemption or an advocate or something. Because God is so holy, so beyond holy, so, something we can't even understand. It's just we use a word holy, but he's like untouchable. Because we are so integrated with sin, that sin issue somehow has to be taken care of. He does want to have a relationship with us, but he can't because of our sin. So that's what he says here. We're guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So he, he cuts through those Judaizers, cuts through the Hebrew roots movement, legalism, and says, you're trying to do this. And you're trying to do this law of God stuff. And what does it say here? No flesh is justified. So all you're doing is futility. 
I mean, it's okay if you want to do it on your own, but once you say everyone else has to do it, once you say unless you do these things, you're not really a good Christian or you're a second class Christian, that bondage they're trying to put on you, and that's what it's talking about. Look, you want to keep the, the Sabbath, you want to do the Passover, you want to try to keep all those laws, you want to be circumcised, you want to do it, that's fine, that's you personally. But the minute you say all Christians has to do it, then that is what he's drawing the line about. He's saying you, you cannot enforce this Hebrew Roots movement on everybody because look, it doesn't even work there outside of Christ. If you're outside of Christ trying to obey, it never worked. You have to go back to Abraham where he trusted in God and that trust or that faith was reckoned unto him as righteousness. You see, having that trust in him, a personal trust in God, a personal relationship with God based upon covenant is the only way. This external way never worked. This is after the fact of the Abrahamic covenant. So you could be in this covenant and not have a real relationship with God. Have you read the Old Testament? We see the fruit of that. People trying to do it on their own without having a relationship with God and it ends horribly. They're in bondage. But those who trusted in God, let's say like David or others, who trusted in God, Samuel, others, who trusted in God personally, they didn't have perfect, but they had a relationship with God and because of that, they could follow God. They could do the commandments because now they had the power to do it. And that's exactly what Paul says. And then we're going to end with this. And we, we should know this by heart. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, lest anyone should boast. You see, if we could earn it, we would boast about it. When we were little kids, didn't we do some kind of thing and say, Look, Mommy, look, Mommy, look at me, look at me, look at me. You see, that's built into us. To, hey, look at me, look at me. You'd be amazed by going to various Facebook pages or whatever, and you see how many selfies people have of their face. It's crazy, because it's, look at me, look at me, look at me. And you see, that's exactly what we see here. See, we would boast about it. We'd say, look what I've done. I've saved myself. Or I've saved others. You see, somehow I did these certain works. There was a bell that rang. I knew I did enough good works, and I made it. You see, that's what we would do. That's how sinful we are. Even in trying to do good stuff, we would end up boasting about it and take a selfie. So, <laughs> so, for by grace you have been saved through faith. So wait a minute. Grace started first. Didn't Jesus die before we were living? Romans 5.8. Think about Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates, not demonstrated. There's a tense there, and it's specific. Continuous, present tense, forever. God demonstrates. He is still demonstrating. He demonstrated, still demonstrated. He will continue to demonstrate His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. Wow. That's the grace. So grace is first. Grace is first in that Holy Spirit came upon you and convicted you of your sins. The light bulb came on and you realize, wow, God is real. The Bible is real. What it says about me as being a sinner is real. There's condemnation and judgment and there is the wrath of God, the lake of fire, hell. Oh my, and I might go there if I keep in this sin. Oh, the cross. I go to the cross where Jesus is crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection. I, I cling to Jesus as he is enough. What he did was enough for me. God punishing his own son on my behalf. You see, that's the gospel. See, that was already happened before. His grace then draws me to the cross, and I trust in him. I trust that what he did was enough. I cling on to him. See, I'm saved through faith and not of myself. I didn't do one thing. Now, some will say, well, isn't faith something you did? Well, yeah, but it's not works. It's thing you didn't earn it. All you did is put your hand out and receive it. Somebody gave you a gift. You can't get it if you go like this. Put your hands behind your back. Nope, I'm not going to receive it. All, now, is that a work? You, did you earn it? No, that gift that's placed in your hand. So that's exactly what he's saying here. 
not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, free gift. It's a, I, I wish I could, I, I should have put free gift. It's a free gift of God. It's free. You can't earn it. All you can do is receive it. It's not a result of works. Nothing you did, not, you can't add to it. And if you take away from it, you don't have it. <laughs> I mean, you have nothing. Lest anyone should boast. You see, that's the genuine gospel of Christ. It should leave you with Jesus and with the body of Christ who are all left with Jesus and nothing else. Now, what do we should do? What should we do? Thank God, praise Him, worship Him, and tell others about Him. It's very simple. Love one another, encourage one another when things are going down in your life. Encourage each other to get back up and spread the gospel again. Keep spreading the gospel. See, that's what he is talking about. What did they get into? What did the Galatian churches get into? Well, we got to follow all these laws. And they got so distracted, they probably weren't sharing the gospel. They were so busy trying to perfect their own relationship with God and keep it. Amen? When you're free, you're freed already up. So then you can love others because God's already loving you. Your, your tank is full. If your tank is full, you're thankful. I mean, thankful, right? You're going to be filled so that you can then do what God asked you to do and ca called you to do. So let's sing this last song and praise the Lord together. Amen.